What is up, everybody? How's everybody doing tonight? That was weak. How's everybody doing tonight? Is everyone doing okay? You're great. That's what I love to hear, man. You're great. You're great. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Um, so tonight we're going to do things a little bit differently. Um, we're going to skip offering and all that stuff, and we're just going to hop right into the Word. But before I hop right into the Word tonight, do we have any first-time guests in the house with us tonight? Do we have, we got one in the back, do we, one over here, another one over here. Can we just, like, clap? Oh, that was weak, guys. Can we give it up for our first-time guests? Yeah, come on, man. We love that you guys are here. Man, it, it, my name is Pastor Josh. I'm the youth pastor here. Listen, we believe that God has an encounter for you tonight. Right, we believe that you're not here on accident, that you didn't just show up because somebody invited you. Man, but we believe that God brought you here because he wants to change you. Amen? Amen, amen. Amen? Come on, a quiet church is a? Oh, that was bad, y'all. A quiet church is a? All right, man, I'm going to pray that we're going to hop right into the word. Jesus, we just bless you, God. We love you. We thank you for who you are. God, right now, we just focus ourselves completely on you. God, we center ourselves completely on you. Jesus, God, we say God, that we're not here for our neighbor. God, our neighbor on the left, our neighbor on the right. But tonight, Jesus, we are here for you, God. God, completely here for you. We bless you, Lord. If everyone could just raise your hands in the air for me, I want you to say, Jesus, tonight I give you permission to mess with my normal. Come and change me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Man, so who remembers uh, the name of the series that we have been talking about for the past three, four weeks? What is it? What is it? It is hello, my name is Revival. Tonight we're talking about part three. Somebody say Trace. Come on, somebody say Trace. So obviously... Uh, the key word in this is the word revival, right? Right? Is the word revival, right? So we, just, so we define revival as when, a, when heaven invades earth so much that earth begins to look like heaven. Come on, how many of you guys want to see earth begin to look like heaven? Come on, how many of you guys want to see earth begin to look like heaven? All right, it's when an unexpected move of God happens. How many of you guys want to see an unexpected move of God? All right, it's been what's dead is brought back to life. You know, in the recent weeks, we've, we, we've talked about revival, man, and, and just what revival could be like and, and what it's like. And I don't know about you guys, but I want to see the stuff that I've, that I've only read about before. All right, maybe is I want to see the stuff that I'm, always, that I'm like, is that even really possible? You know, if I was honest with you guys, is that that's the stuff that I want to see. But we said that revival doesn't just happen. That revival is not just going to fall out of the sky and hit us. But guess what, man? That revival happens when you adopt a certain lifestyle. Right? Revival is a byproduct of a certain lifestyle. And that's what we've been talking about in this series called Hello, My Name is Revival. So we said if you're willing to say, Hello, My Name is Revival, then you have to adopt a lifestyle of at least these five things. And, and so the first week we talked about, man, what personal revival. We talked all about personal revival. The second week we talked about intimacy. And we talked about, we haven't talked about this one yet, prayer and fasting. The fourth one is risk taking. And the fifth one is accountability or community here. And so on the first week when we talked about personal revival, we said that before revival ever came to a region, man, is that before revival ever swept a nation or, or, or hit a high school, man, or came to a city, that it first came to a heart. Right? Right? That before revival ever came to a city or a region, that it first came to a heart. Right? Right? And so if you want God to come to your high school, to come to your house, I mean, to come to your city, then it first has to happen in your heart. Right? Right? Come on, are you guys awake tonight? No, are you guys awake tonight? Come on, this side, are you awake? Kind of. This side, are you awake? This side, are you awake? This side, are you awake? I'm going to give you guys another chance because everybody out did y'all. Y'all have one of the most packed sections. Is this side awake? Get lit. Oh, I'm just kidding. That's so lame. That's so lame. I'm so cool. So cool. Coolest youth pastor in the world. <laughs> all right. Said no one ever. That's all right, though. So we said, though, 
that when personal revival happens, that it always leads to intimacy, right? That when personal revival happens, that it always leads to intimacy, is that your relationship with God is not built just in the public moments, right? It's not built just on a Sunday and a Wednesday night, but guess what? It's built in private. I mean, it's built when you grab your Bible, when no one else is watching, and you get before God and you start to study his word. I mean, it's built when no one else is around and you go to YouTube and you type in some uh, Bethel anointed worship, man, and you begin worshiping and lifting your hands and, and singing your heart up before God when no one else is around. See, your, your relationship with God is built, man, when no one else is around and you begin praying. I mean, when, when, when not only for your needs, not only for the things that you want, but number one, to get to know him. Because that's what prayer is about. It's about knowing him. But two, man, when you start praying for your school, come on, man, when you start praying for your lost friends, when you start praying for those around you, right? Right? Come on, a quiet church is a. So this is what I have learned this far. And this is what we're talking about. Our third point is risk takers. Come on, somebody say risk takers. Is that intimacy creates people who are risk takers. Hear me tonight, intimacy creates people who are risk takers. See, listen to this, is that intimacy, uh, intimacy, Jesus, help me. Intimacy with God leads you to take risk for God. Hear me tonight, intimacy with God leads you to take risk for God. You see, I want to ask you a dangerous question right now. Jesus, help me. How many of you guys have ever been in love before? <laughs> if you're not married in here or over the age of... 18, put your hand down. Put your hand down, son. He said, I'm in high school. How am I supposed to know? Right answer. Ten points for you. But listen, is that, how many of you guys know is that when people, quote, unquote, say that they're in love, that they do some really crazy things? Right? Right? Yo, like my fellows in here, like you know when there's that girl that you really, really want to impress. Right, you'll go out of your way around you. Man, you'll do whatever you have to do to get this girl's attention. Right, I mean, listen, you're going to risk looking stupid. I mean, you're, you're going to risk people not liking you anymore. Why? Because you have this one chica, this one boo thing. You know what I'm saying, man? This one shenanay in mind for you, right? And you're going to say, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get their attention. And ladies, don't act like it's just on the fellas. Don't act like it's just on those. Listen, y'all, we see y'all. I wonder if he's going to notice me. We see y'all. I think it's no, is that when you're in love, you take risks for the person that you love. Because it's the same thing with God. See, when I'm in love with God, I begin taking risks for God. So when I have intimacy with him, man, that risk level just begins to increase and increase and increase and increase. Right? Amen? So tonight, man, I believe that God is going to cha change and turn some of us into some wild risk takers tonight. And, and so moving on and defining the word risk taker, it's this. The risk taker is a... Cool. And how many of you guys know someone who's a risk taker? Yeah, I mean, I mean y'all know who I'm talking about. Is I'm not just talking about when you like your booth thing. I, I mean, this person is like a daredevil. You know, I mean, they do like stupid stuff just because they can. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about tonight. You know, these people are crazy. I, I mean, listen, like this person, like, it, it's like you know that it's definitely going to end out in pain, but it could possibly end up in death. Like, 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 you know what I'm saying? Like, when this person's like, hey, bro, I'm thinking about doing this. Like, are you stupid? <laughs> you know, like, what is wrong with you right now? You know what I'm saying? It, it, is that, to be honest with you guys, you know, is that I can't claim that I'm, like, this wild risk taker, but I believe that I have, like, really stupid moments in life. Okay? Where, where like, something just hits me, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to try it. Like, listen, like, I, like it, it comes in spurts. Like, I won't ride roller coasters. Like the like, like that ride at Wet and Wild, like the pool that's like a thousand and million feet up in the air that goes straight down. I will not ride that. I don't care if you come down in three seconds. I could die in three seconds. All right, I won't ride that. Listen, but 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 I have these moments that just hit me sometimes where I'm like, bro, I'm gonna do this, and everybody's like, why? I'm like, I don't know. And I just do stupid stuff. Like, 
I have several stories to choose from here. Um, which one am I going to go with? Uh, I'm thinking, which one am I going to go with? Have you guys heard the ripstick story yet? Some of you guys have. You, have you guys heard the fighting gym story yet? The fighting gym? Okay, you guys haven't heard the fighting gym. So we'll, we'll, we'll go with this one. So, so out of the desires of my heart to impress a girl, right, who liked tough guys. And so I said, I need to do something to show her how tough I am. And so, you know, like some guys work out, whatever. I decided to go and join an MMA fighting gym, right? Because like for, this for me was like, yo, like you ain't tougher than like doing MMA. And, and so I remember I went and joined this gym. Like my stomach was in knots when I showed up. I was scared. People were big, large, very muscular, <laughs> trained to kill. And I had never fought somebody in my life, <laughs> you know. And so I remember I show up at this gym, right. And so we're going and we're learning. So I come the first day. And it's like, okay, it wasn't, like, it wasn't that bad. Um, and, and so then I come, like, the next day, and I show up. And I remember, um, so we're sparring, and we're doing it, and I punch, like, a little girl. Right? I'm like, eh, eh, right? And all these big dudes are like, yo, what's wrong with this dude? <laughs> you know? and, and so I remember, like, it, it came time for, like, free sparring where you just pick an opponent, man. Like, you go for a round, and then you alternate off. And I met this guy named Jesse. Now, Jesse happens to be one of the best fighters in the gym one of the best fighters in the gym. He has, like, eight titles, like, eight belts, like, is undefeated in, in, in his professional record. Like, 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 this guy's a professional fighter. Like, he goes and competes. And, and so I remember during free time, I said, yo, if I want to be the best, I got to fight the best. So I said, so I said, yo, Jesse, you want to spar? <laughs> and, you know, he's a really nice dude. So he's like, yeah, bro, yeah, you know, no worries. And so we're going and we're sparring, right? And so I, I saw this, like, opening chance to shine for glory. So I go, whew, whew, I don't know what I'm doing. I go, and I hit him, like, square in the face, and I got off, like, this really good shot. And I was like, oh, yeah, right? And so Jesse's like, like he, his head doesn't even move. <laughs> he just stands there like this, and he's like, all right. So, like, he squares up his shoulders, and he's going. And he, he starts doing this thing where he starts, like, dancing with his head in his hands, I just get, like, memorized. You know, like, I mean, I guess I've ever seen the Karate Kid. You know, the very end where he's like this, and the guy's like, that's real. <laughs> okay, that is real. And so, and so I remember I'm going, I'm just kind of stopping, and I'm looking, and all of a sudden he comes out of nowhere, like, and just, and, like, just knocks me in the face. Like, I, said, I don't only get hit, but I'm, like, right here, and the wall's, like, right here. Now, on this back wall, there are mats lining all around the back wall that are, like, Velcro to the wall. And so I get hit. I go flying to the back wall, right? I hit the back wall. I grab the top of the mats to try to keep myself up, but I did not know that they were Velcro. Right? So I grab the top of the mats and to hold on for dear life, and as I'm looking, the Velcro is peeling off the wall, and, like, I pull down, like, almost a whole wall of Velcro on top of myself in front of all these really big, tough guys. Somebody say, stupid. He's like, are you all right? I'm like, yeah, man, I'm good. I'm good. Anyways, it was dumb. It was dumb. So, but, man, we are called to be risk takers. Amen? Amen. We're called to be risk takers. Is that we, said that we said over the past few weeks that Jesus has called every Christian, every Christian to be a revivalist. Is that somebody turn to your neighbor and say, you are called. Come on, no, you say, you are called. Come on, y'all. You guys say, you are called to be a revivalist. Now we said, now we said that a revivalist is someone who is willing to be used by God to do whatever, whenever, however. A revivalist is somebody who wants to be used by God to do whatever, whenever, however. Come on, is it how many of you guys know that revivalists are risk takers? Come on, revivalists are risk takers. I mean, is that revivalists are willing to put their reputation, man, their comfort, their security on the line to achieve the goal at hand. Right? Just like me, I was like, man, I'm going to put my reputation online to impress this girl, even though, like, she lives states away. I, I guess I thought I would go home and tell her about it. I don't know. Um, but, man, it was crazy it, it, is that they're willing to put their reputation, their comfort, their security in danger for the goal, and that goal is the kingdom of God. Come on, that goal is the kingdom of God. 
is that Jesus is calling you to be a risk taker for the kingdom. Is that, listen, is that I believe that a risk taker, I mean, is someone who's ruined for normal. Come on, is someone who's ruined for normal. I mean, I believe a risk taker is, is that they're not okay with the status quo. Come on, they're not okay with what's normal. Come on, they're not okay with things staying the same as they've always been. Right? Like, I mean, I look at all these guys who do, like, stupid stuff when risk-taking, like, daredevil stuff. Like, today I was watching a video of some guy who jumped, like, from the stratosphere from Red Bull down to Earth and parachuted. It was crazy. You know, but something in him said, is that I'm not okay with the status quo that we've only jumped this far so far. Is that I want to go higher. Is that, man, I want to do more. I want to see better. Come on, I believe that God is waiting for somebody to say, is that, man, I'm not okay with what's normal in my school. Man, I'm not okay, man, with there are kids, man, on drugs. Man, I'm not okay, man, with people wanting to commit suicide. Man, I'm not okay with homosexuality running rampant in my school. Is that we need to see a revival. So, God, I will take risks. God, use me whenever to do whatever, however. Come on, God, I'll take some risk for your kingdom. Amen. Amen. Come on, is anybody awake? Come on, is anybody awake? Hey, quiet church is a... Listen, a risk taker cares more about bringing necessary change than keeping peace. Hear me? A risk taker cares more about bringing necessary change than keeping peace. I Means that they care more about bringing change than maintaining the comfort of those around them. God, I would step out. God, I would be a risk taker, but it might really upset this person. Or, or God, or what if they don't really like me? Listen, you, we got to get this now. If you're going to do anything for God, people won't like you. People won't like you. Listen, when I look, out, when I look through history, I mean, most risk takers who, who change history, who change the future, men that we praise now as these awesome men and as these awesome women, is that when they were alive, they were hated. When they were alive, people did not like them. When they were alive, they weren't popular. Why? Because they were changing things, and people don't like change. So listen, you got to, we got to get this, guys. Jesus said this. He says, if you bear my name, you'll be hated. If you bear my name, you'll be hated. Listen, you're not going to be the most popular if you're really stepping out for God. Listen, you won't be the most, like, you won't have the most friends, but that's okay. Why? Because I'm a risk taker for God. Because, man, I got the kingdom inside me, baby, and I got to unleash it. Why? Because... I care more about this person's soul than my own comfort, than my own level of popularity. Come on, amen? Amen. You guys here with me tonight? This is one of my favorite books of the Bible is the book of Acts. How many of you guys love the book of Acts? How many of you guys have read the book of Acts? If you haven't read the book of Acts, go read the book of Acts. Listen, is that why? Because it's full of revivalists, man. Is that, listen, is that the book of Acts is literally um, a, a recording of revival happening in the early church. That is what it is. It's revival happening in the early church. And, and so you have these guys who are complete revivalists. It, is that they're called the apostles or the disciples. And I love it is that in Acts 17, 6, this is how it describes them. It says, but when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Come on, listen to this. These who have turned the world upside down comes here too, has come here too. Now, the word upside down, this means several things. It can mean to um, unravel. It can mean to unsettle things. But my favorite definition that I found is that it means this. It means to drive from one's home. It means to drive from one's home. Now, were the apostles going around and kicking people out of their houses? Somebody say no. I said no. And so what in the world are these guys talking about here is I believe they were talking about stuff that they didn't even really know, is that the disciples who heard the words of Jesus in Mark 16, um, 15 through 18, which says this, it says, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. Next verse. 
These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name, and they will speak in new languages. They will able to, to be handled snakes with safety. And if drink and uh, Jesus help me. And if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick, and they will be healed. Listen, is that the disciples remembered Mark 16, and they took this call seriously. Like this was their mandate, this was their mission in life, is that they live for nothing more than to see this happen. So what was happening is that, man, they got baptized in the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. Then they went around and started making revival happen around them. Is that they became revival. Is that all of a sudden, all the places where hell had made its home, they were kicking out. To drive from one's home, see where hell had made its home in diseases, is that they begin to lay hands on the sick and see diseases disappear. You see, where, when they begin to preach the gospel, multitudes, thousands of people began to get saved. When they began to lay hands on deaf ears, they were open. When they began to lay hands on blind eyes, they were open. They began to see the lame walk people who suffered with diseases for 30, 40 years of their life. By just walking up to them and saying, silver and gold I do not have, but in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. Come on, what if you went up to somebody in your school who you know had been in a wheelchair all of their life? I mean, that you've known since like first or second grade, and you walked up to them and you said, silver and gold I do not have, but in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. They might ask you, I didn't ask for silver or gold, I just thought about that. But you say, man, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And what if they walked? What would happen? Come on, what would happen if you took a risk? Come on, what would happen if we left our comfort zones? Come on, what would happen if you began to pray for the sick and you saw them get healed? Man, what would happen if you began to actually preach the gospel to that kid in your school who you know needs Jesus? Listen, not, not just inviting them to church. Inviting people to church is awesome. It's great. We love that. I mean, you want to bring them here. We'll preach the gospel to them here. But listen, if your evangelism, if your witnessing um, goes only as far as, hey, please, please come to church with me, then you don't know how to witness. If I can be real. So where am I in my notes? I have no clue. All right, here we go. Is I love it because here are these guys, they're walking around, man, and they're bringing heaven to earth everywhere they go, and they're kicking out hell. This is, I mean, I believe that we're supposed to be people who turn the world upside down too, I mean, that we're supposed to be people who kick out hell where hell has made its home. This man is that, listen, I want to go places, and I want demons to start jumping out of the windows because I walked in the room. Because I carry Jesus so much with me, man, that hell gets scared when I walk in a place. Amen? Listen, I love this because Mark 16, the same call, the same mandate, man, it applies to you too. See, you're called to lay hands on the sick and see them healed. Man, you're called to lay hands on deaf ears and watch them opened up. You're called to lay hands on blind eyes and watch them open up. You're called to cast out demons. You are not just Pastor Josh, I mean, not just DGU staff, I mean, not just Pastor Al and Ms. Tava. No, you are because you're a believer. I think we said it a couple weeks ago, but man, that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. Lives in me. Is that you're called to do all of those things, amen? But listen, why did these guys see heaven come to earth? It, one simple thing, they took a risk. They simply, man, they took a risk. Is that, what if Peter and John in Acts 2 Never said to the man at the gate, beautiful, hey, silver and gold we do not have, get up and walk, because that thought in the back of their head says, man, what if he doesn't walk? What if he doesn't get healed? And so, you know, I'm not sure I'm at that level yet, and so I'm just not going to say anything. It's, man, the Bible is full of risks. The Bible is full of, man, what if that doesn't happen moments? See, if you're anything like me, and when you step out because you feel like God's telling you to do something, you know, all of a sudden, if you're anything like me, even now, like if I were to go to a gas station and God says, hey, I want you to go preach the gospel to this person, I promise you this would happen, that all of a sudden I get sick to my stomach. <laughs> like, I start asking questions like, God, are you sure? 
No, I, th- I think that was me. Go preach to that person. That was God. All right. Um, and th- then all of a sudden, like, my hands get sweaty, right? And, and, and my voice gets shaky, and it might crack a couple times. You know, like, hey, bro. Oh, gosh. You know, like, come on, has it happened to anybody in here before where you just get, like, super nervous before God tells you to do something? And listen, and I don't know about you, but there have been many times that I have backed out instead of moved forward. Where I have refused to take the risk instead of move forward because I've always thought, what if it doesn't happen? What if it doesn't happen? Come on, am I alone tonight? That clock cannot say only eight minutes. Jesus, help me. Just got done with my intro, y'all. Come on. Jesus, help me. So if you're going to be a risk taker in this place, man, I want to give you three tips that will help you out. Come on, man, man. If you want to go into your environment and if you, you want to see God use you in mighty and powerful ways, these are three things that you absolutely need. And so the first one is this, is that being a risk taker requires faith. Come on, being a risk taker requires faith. And so defining faith tonight is, is this, is that faith is to believe to rely on, to trust, to be fully convinced that God is who he says he is and that he will do what he said he will do. I'm going to read that again. It is that faith means to believe, to rely on, to trust, to be fully convinced that God is who he says he is and that he will do what he said he will do. And so for me, how I like to think of faith is I like to think of faith as the ultimate trust fall. How many, how many guys know what a trust fall is? In fact, Kiefer, if you could... Come up to the stage for me. I'm putting my life in your hands in this moment. If you let me die, my wife and my daughter will get you. Nope, you should be standing down there, baby. Here, we're going for it, bro. <laughs> we're taking a risk. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay, now listen, listen, listen. This is huge. This is huge. This is huge. All right, faith is not a noun, it's not an adjective, faith is a verb, faith is a verb, now now, if you know anything about verbs, you know that verbs are action words, right, is that in order for a verb to happen, is that it takes action to make it happen, right, if you say go, and I'm over here, I'm saying I'm going, move, I'm moving, you'd be like, dude, you are stupid, you know what I'm saying, like, did, did, did you go to school? No. Why? Because you need to move to move. You need to go to go. And so, therefore, it, it requires action on your part. Now, now, hear me. Faith is more than just acknowledging certain facts about God. Like I said, I can't acknowledge. Man, Kiefer's a handsome dude, almost as handsome as me. You know, his muscles are almost as big as mine. Come on, flex, flex for me, bro. Yeah, see, he's scared. He's scared. His muscles are almost as big as mine. Listen, I can acknowledge when I fall, Keeper has the full ability to catch me. (laughs) But guess what? Unless I fall, I'm not saying, man, I'm relying on him. I'm believing in him. I'm putting my trust in him. Is that unless I move, it means nothing. I can say about God, I mean, I believe that God's a healer. I mean, I believe God's good. I mean, I believe God is almighty and he's all powerful. I mean, I believe that God saves the lost. But guess what? Unless I move, it means nothing. It means nothing. See, but there's something about saying, man, I'm going to rely on Jesus. (laughs) Yeah, it's about to happen, bro. It's about to happen, bro. Okay. You know, saying, all right, God, I'm going to step out. And God, I'm going to pray. Why? Because I'm believing, I'm trusting, and I'm relying. Oh, God. (laughs) Somebody give it up for Kiefer. See, listen, listen tonight. When you rely on and have a personal trust in someone, it produces action and obedience. It produces action and obedience. Listen, faith always produces action. It's impossible to have faith and no action. And I'll prove it to you. In fact, before I go there, you know, the reason why I picked Kiefer is because Kiefer spends probably 
three, two to three, maybe even four days at my house a week. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's all seven. I'm like, dude, will you leave? You know, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But listen, but listen, unless I know somebody, I'm not going to give them my trust. Unless I know somebody, listen, I was not going to pull up one of y'all that I did not know to catch me. All right, I value the back of this noggin. It's a beautiful thing, okay? So listen, this is why what I talked about, talked about two weeks ago is so important, is, is that if I don't get to know God in private, I won't move for him in public. Come on, if I don't get to know God in private, I won't move for him in public. Why? Because I don't know him. I don't know his character. I mean, I don't know what he's like. I mean, I don't know if he's a God of his word. But when I go and I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm in my private place and I'm reading my word and I find out about the character of God I mean, and I'm in the presence and I'm worshiping I mean, and I'm out praying, all of a sudden this confidence and this boldness begins to rise up inside of me. It says, man, I'm going to step out and I'm going to take risks because I know who my God is. I know who my God is. Come on, are you hearing me tonight? Listen, God isn't just calling you to present your faith. He's calling you to demonstrate it. Hear me, God isn't just calling you to present your faith. He's calling you to demonstrate it. Listen, presentation without demonstration is an abomination. Presentation without demonstration is an abomination. That's, that's how the church got to the state that it's in now. Why it's dead, why there's no power anymore. And why the church is full of a bunch of scared hypocrites who won't move. Why? Because they're so used to presentation and they're not used to demonstration that, that, that now this world of presentation is filled up with so much fear that they won't step out anymore. Come on, God is calling you to demonstrate the gospel. Isn't Paul said this, he, he says that the gospel is not in word only, but it's in power. It's in power. You have power. Listen, listen to this. Remember, my thing just said, stop preaching. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. iPad. James chapter 2, verse, verse 14 through 17. It says this. It says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can you, sorry, can that, can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister with no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well. Say, warm and eat well. You don't have food. You don't have clothing. I know you're going to freeze to death, but you know, it's not my responsibility. Focus, focus, focus. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good, good deeds, it is dead and useless. It is dead and useless. Next verse, I believe it's verse 26. So just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. Now listen, James gives us really powerful an illustration of food and clothing. But man, isn't it the same thing when I see somebody who's not saved? Isn't it the same thing when I know that the power of God is inside of me and, and I see this person sick? Man, and the Bible says that all I have to do is lay hands on them and pray and they will recover? You know, I love a guy by the name of Todd White. How many of you guys know who Todd White is? If you don't know who, who, who Todd White is, your homework for this week is to go in YouTube and type him and just listen to Todd White. He will rock your socks off, man. I, I, I really like him because he preaches without su shoes on. One of my dreams in life. Um, but I love Todd White because, like, before Todd White was really Todd White, now he's this internationally known speaker, preaches, um, sees healings every like do praise for everybody everywhere he goes crazy boldness but but I love it because before he became Todd White he would read verses like this in the Bible and he would read verses like Mark 16 and he would say I mean I'm going in Walmart for the sole purpose of seeing people healed and so he would go in Walmart and spend three hours in there praying for people to save stay them healed and you know what's amazing he says man for like the first thousand people that I prayed for Yes, a thousand people that I prayed for, I saw nobody healed. I didn't see one person healed. But it was after that that I had this breakthrough moment. I mean, and, and, and I saw this lady healed. And all of a sudden, like healing just bursted forth in his life. 
Now, what's, what's the lesson here? Listen, it's, it's the law of averages. If you pray for enough people, I promise you eventually somebody will get touched by God. Somebody will get healed. Somebody will get saved. Come on, man, it just takes one person to light a fire. Right? Right? I mean, we got to move. All right, so skip all of that stuff. I had some good stuff for you guys, but we're skipping it. Um, risk, or point number two, I'm sorry, is that risk requires boldness. Risk requires boldness. Uh, the Bible says in Acts 4, chapter 29, it, it says, And now, O Lord, hear their threats. And give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after this prayer, the meeting place shook. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. Listen, with boldness. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's great blessing was upon them all. Now I love, I love, I love this because the word boldness here, it means this. It means an outspoken, unreserved, unreserved freedom of speech. It's an outspoken, unreserved freedom of speech. Now what's so powerful about this word boldness is that this isn't a human type of boldness. This isn't something that you can get. This is something that you can't muster up on your own. It is that this literally is a word that comes only from the Holy Spirit. It's that this is a divine, God-given boldness. And I'm going to say this tonight. It's available for anybody who's willing to ask for it. Come on, it's available for anybody who's willing to, to take risk. Listen, most of us want to get to this place in our walk with Jesus. Man, we're, we're so bold, right, man? And God tells us to do something, and I step out there, and, and you're like, the man or woman of God of the hour with power, right, baby? Like, and you have no fear. Listen, that is like nobody ever. <laughs> okay? Nobody ever. I can promise you when Jesus tells Pastor Al to still go and do stuff, I guarantee you there's still levels of fear in there. Am I right? His wife says, I'm sure I'm right. Listen to me. I mean, listen, courage is not. The, the absence of fear. Courage is moving in spite of fear. Listen, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is moving in spite of fear. Hear me tonight. So listen, if you're waiting for that moment where you never feel fear, you'll be dead <laughs> by the time that comes around. You'll be in heaven, and, and, and it will be too, too, too late. And, and I believe, um, I, I, I love what Pastor Pat said. On, on Sunday, he says that he believes in heaven, man, there's going to be, be, be a screen of everything that I did for God and everything that I could have done for God. And I believe, man, I'm going to look at this screen. I'm going to see moments where God told me to do stuff, and, and, and he pointed stuff out for me to do. But I'm going to see those moments where I said, God, what if it doesn't happen? And there was so much fear in me that it kept me from moving forward. And I'm going to see all those moments where God could have used me and what I could have done. Listen, don't let that be you tonight. Come on, I believe tonight, when, when I was in prayer of what God wanted to do, uh, what I saw, and, and please don't get weird on me or think this is super weird, um, but what I saw was it's almost like a chain around people's mouths, and there was a lock. And tonight, I believe that God is wanting to unlock that lock and to release the chain from your mouth, man, and to give you that unspoken, unreserved freedom of speech for the kingdom of God. I believe that's what God is wanting to do with us tonight. One of my favorite Bible verses is this. It says, perfect love casts out all fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. Did you know you can't rebuke fear? That's nowhere in the Bible. When fear shows up, I can't say, in the name of Jesus, fear, I rebuke you. It's not going to work. There's only one thing that casts out fear. It's what? It's love, perfect love. And so when I get an understanding, once again, of who my God is, I mean, that God is not just a God up in the sky, but God is Emmanuel. He's God with me. I mean, he's Papa God who loves me unconditionally. And listen, and God's never going to call you to do something to fail at it. God's never going to call you to do something to fail at it. He's not going to go say, hey, I want you to go pray for, the, for that guy over there. And it's like, 
Holy Spirit, this totally is not going to work. <laughs> what a sucker. No. That's not the character of God. Amen. Last point, really quickly before we close, in like a minute and a half, is that, listen, is that you're not called to take risk alone. You're not called to take risk alone. It is that a revivalist needs a community around himself or herself. Like, what I love about the Bible is that even Jesus sent the disciples out two by two. Is that when I look at the Bible, do you know I never really see anybody doing the work of God alone? Never. Right? I mean, like, when I look at the Bible, I see Jesus and the 12 disciples. I mean, I see um, David and Jonathan. I mean, I see Moses and Aaron and Miriam. I see Peter and John. I see Paul and Barnabas. I mean, Paul and Silas. Is that there's always somebody else there. And, and this is where I got to make my shameless plug tonight. Is that, guys, this is why we have house parties. Okay, this isn't just a time for us to eat pizza and to be dumb. No, this is for you to be in community. Why? Because one of our core um, beliefs here, uh, one of our core values is that we do life together. Why? Because you are not called to do life alone. Listen, God has not called you to do life alone. You're called to do life in fellowship with other believers. Why? Because the devil knows that if he can get you alone, he can kill you. And you know, I, I think it's interesting um, I, I super hope I have my facts right. I may not have my facts right, so forgive me, National Geographic, if I'm wrong. It, it, is that the Bible says is that the devil is, is, is like a roaming lion looking for whom he can devour. Now, when you study out how lions attack, what they do is they look for the one who gets left behind. They look for the one who gets isolated by themselves. Listen, the devil looks for the one who gets isolated by himself. And that's when he pounces and that's when he attacks so house parties listen house parties are happening this friday night this friday night listen you guys need to come you need to be in com, com, oh jesus help me community thank you it's it, it's those c words bro those c words they give me trouble is that you need to be in community see how you did we just gotta be nice and easy about it um so listen at the door is that that they're going to be offering buckets back back there, but they're also going to be handing out this information right here. Listen, we want to see you guys this Friday night. Listen, don't be isolated. Don't do life by yourself because you are called to do life together. You are called to do life together with other believers. Listen, it, it, it's, that, it, it's called brotherhood, y'all, and, and I got to stop preaching. I got to shut up. So this is what we're going to do is that I need everyone to close their eyes. Close your eyes for me. Close your eyes for me. Is that the first thing I have to ask is this. I mean, is that do you know Jesus? Is Jesus the Lord of your life? Come on, the Bible says that me and you were born into something called sin. And this thing called sin, man, this poison in, in our veins that we couldn't escape, is that it separated us from God for an eternity, man. Is that it put us in rebellion against God. Is that the Bible says is that me and you, is that we were enemies of God. We were enemies of God. And we were separated from God for forever, man, destined to spend an eternity in hell because the wages of sin is death. But what I love is that the Bible says that God didn't want this, man, that God was so passionate about being in relationship with you that he sent his only son named Jesus Christ to come down man, and, and, and to pay your debt, man, to pay the price for your sin. And so Jesus came and he died on the cross and he took the sins of humanity on himself. He took that thing that was separating us from God and he died. But three days later, he rose from the grave, conquering sin and conquering death. And he said these words. He says, if anyone confesses me as the Lord of their life and believes in their heart that I was raised from the dead on the third day, then they will be saved. Come on, tonight you have a moment. Tonight you have a chance to come into relationship with the living God. This thing isn't about rules. It's not about religion. I mean, it's not about doing right and wrong. It's about relationship with God. Tonight, Jesus wants to start a relationship with you. A relationship. Well, Pastor Josh, how do I do that? It's super easy. He doesn't make it hard. You've got to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And you've got to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Listen, this is more than just saying a, a, a simple prayer or quoting me. Man, this, this is a heart decision. This is a heart action. It's no different than when a man is at an altar with his wife and he says his vows. 
for her and saying, for the rest of my life, I'm being committed to you. I'm confessing that you are my one and only for forever. In this moment right here, that's what we're about to do, but with God. So tonight, if that's you and you say, man, I want to give my life to Jesus. Maybe you said the prayer before. Maybe you've said it hundreds of times, but you know you're not right with God. And tonight, you want to stand at the altar with Jesus, and you want to make that choice. You want to make that commitment. I want you to raise your hands on the count of three. One, two, three. Thank you. I see your hand. Is, is, is there anybody else in here? Thank you. I see your hand. Is there anybody else in here? Thank you. I see your hand. Every eye closed, every head bowed, please. Thank you. I see your hand. Is there anybody else? You can put your hands down if they're up. Is there anybody else? Ten more seconds. Come on, y'all. Don't let this moment pass you by if this is you. We're talking about an eternity here. This is an eternal choice. You're not promised tomorrow when hell's a very real place. Thank you. I see your hand. Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else? Ten more seconds. Awesome. If everyone could just stand up for me tonight. I want everyone to close your eyes for me, and, and I want you to pray this with me. Um, I just want you to say, say, God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die for my sin. I recognize and confess that Jesus died, but he rose from the grave on the third day. And so right now, I repent. I ask for forgiveness for all of my sins. I need the blood of Jesus to wash my life clean. And right now, I confess Jesus as the Lord, the ruler, the king of my life for forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Now with every head down, every eye closed, man, tonight I believe that God wants to give us boldness in this place. Come on, tonight I believe that God wants to give us an unreserved, unspoken freedom. An unreserved, unspoken freedom. So tonight, if that's you, man, and you feel like almost like your lips have been bound up with fear and fear has kept you from moving, man, for far too long, but tonight you want to say, man, is it I want that fear broken off my life? Is it, man, I want to understood that I'm loved and I want to move in boldness. I just want you to raise your hands in the air right now. Come on, if that's you right now, just, 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 just both hands nice and high in the air. Both hands nice and high in the air. Yeah, come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. All right, this is what, this is what I want to do is I actually want us to repeat, man, that same prayer in, in Acts. I'm believing tonight that the same thing is going to happen, man, that God is going to fill you with boldness, and you're going to testify powerfully about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So, so this is what I want us to say. I want you to say, and now, O oh Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Father, tonight we thank you. God, I thank you that tonight that your boldness, God, is entering this place, God. That tonight that we're being shaken with boldness, God. We're being shaken with boldness, God, that we'll no longer be silent, God. That literally, God, that right now I just prophesy and claim that in the name of Jesus, God, that's like there's that lock that's being unlocked, God, and those are the chains that are falling, God, and that you're giving us, God, that unreserved, God, boldness that only comes from you, Holy Spirit, that it doesn't come from anybody else but from you, Holy Spirit. So we thank you for a fresh feeling of the Holy Spirit right now a fresh feeling of the Holy Spirit in our beings, and for boldness, God, to preach your word, and for boldness, God, to do signs, wonders, and miracles. Father, we thank you, God, for revival, God, breaking out among us. We love you, Jesus, and we bless you. In the name of Jesus, everyone said amen, amen, amen. Come on with it, man. Now, listen, can I have, like, two or three leaders down front for me here um, that um, are available? Listen, tonight... If you got saved, I want you to come and see these guys down front. And, and tonight, at the very end, I talked about being baptized or being filled with the Holy Spirit. If you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't, you, you don't even know what I'm talking about tonight. And you want to see that happen 
in your life or you just want to know, know more about it, come and talk to one of these guys. Sound good? All right, we love you guys. Be blessed. Have a great, great, great night. Or if you need prayer for anything, come down here and see these guys. But listen, grab a card at the door with the house party's information in it. Don't do life alone. Do life together.